Hello. Welcome, folks. We have people joining in, so we're gonna we're gonna um, wait a couple of minutes to make sure uh, everybody has an opportunity to to join. See a lot of familiar faces, a few familiar names. Welcome, folks. All right, let me give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Thanks everyone for your patience. All righty. So I know that there are a few people who I'm expecting to see who haven't jumped on yet. So we'll just keep an eye out for them. Uh, my name is Karen Robinson. I'm the program director of Speak Truth to Power and welcome all. And at this point, I'm going to pass it off to Isabella. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Isabella robinson Clitty. I am a senior at George School in Newtown, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm really excited to be here. So to start off, we're going to do a little housekeeping. Um, can everyone please make sure that your audio is off during this? And then, okay, so then after Dr. Hamilton completes his comments, I will ask the questions from the registration. And then after we address questions, after we, sorry, after we address questions sent in with the registration, we will call on participants to ask their questions or share a reflection or thought about their own activism. If you would like to ask Dr. Hamilton your questions, please put asterisks next to your question and we'll throw it at you. Remember when you do that, please include your name and where you are from. So to finish off, students, the final session will directly address your issues and how you are taking action. Please send your answers to the three questions in the chat to STTP. The first question is, what issues, issues do you most care about? What change would you like to see on that issue? And then how have you and or would you like to take action? And you can send these responses to STTP at rfkhumanrights.org. So welcome to the second event in the Speak Truth to Power Human Rights Defender Speaker Series. Speak Truth to Power is a human rights education program of Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights was founded soon after Robert Kennedy was assassinated. The organization was founded by his family and friends to carry on his unfinished business addressing civil rights, farmer work rights, social justice, and human rights. A core strategic area of RFK human rights is that everyone is a human rights defender. Over the course of this speaker series, we hope students and educators alike gain a new and perhaps greater insight into how everyone can protect, promote, and defend human rights. Today, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Derek Hamilton. Derek is the executive director of the Kerman Institute for the study, sorry, for the study of race and ethnicity, and he is a professor at the John Glenn College of Public Affairs, both at the Ohio State University. An internationally re recognized scholar in the state Sorry, my sister's yelling at our dogs, but so. Um, an internationally recognized scholar in the field of stratification economics, Hamilton's work focuses on the effects of racial, gender, and ethnic inequality in education, economics, health, and health outcomes. Derek was recently also appointed to the Biden-Sanders Economic Unity Task Force. So, hand it to you, Derek. Thank you. Um, it is an honor to be able to speak before you all. Uh, the mission of human rights, what can be more important than that? And I'd say that a big part of my work is dedicated to an aspect of that, which is economic rights, ensuring that everyone has the adequate resources that they need in order to be able to have agency, dignity, choice, and be able to thrive in their lives. So I, I wanna begin by saying that my motivation to be a scholar is not simply because of my love of knowledge and knowledge creation, um, but I'm motivated by what Reverend William Barber, who is the one of the leaders of the Moral Mondays Poor People's Campaign, 
has proclaimed, to me, economic justice should be a moral imperative. So hence, my work is dedicated towards ensuring the morality and economic justice of our society so that everyone can thrive. So I'm, my, my objective as an economist is to produce knowledge with the explicit intent to build economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity, and also with the Nobel laureate Amarta Sin, who's an economist, has proclaimed a human capabilities frame. What, 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 are, what is necessary to enable people to attain their self-defined goals? So I'm, I'm going to start with a, a PowerPoint uh, to present some of my work, and uh, as well as my framing, and the ability for scholars to influence, influence uh, society more general. I believe I'm sharing. All right. Um, so, you know, here's an example of, of me having an opportunity to present with Senator Warren, Senator Sanders, and Michael Moore at a town hall in DC that took place in 2018. And I'm gonna show you a clip from, from that, that, uh, that event. There virtually has never been a substantial black middle class if we're defining it in terms of wealth. It's not just wealth as an outcome, it's what wealth can do for your life. We've talked about political power. If you got wealth, you can get political power. If you're faced with an expensive legal system, wealth will allow you to address that condition. If you have medical bills, wealth allows you to address your condition. If you want to send your child to an elite private school or university, those that have wealth can do so. We often think about wealth in terms of what, what the end is, but the real power of wealth is what it can do for people. It gives you choice, it gives you freedom, it gives you agency. Now let's think about what wealth is in terms of numbers. The top 10% of households have over 75% of the nation's wealth. The bottom 50% of households have about 1% of the nation's wealth. So however unequal we are in terms of wealth, race becomes a bigger predictor of somebody's wealth position than class itself. The typical black household has about 10 cents on the dollar as the typical white household, and that's including home equity. We know that if you are a head of household and you're black and you graduated from college, your family's wealth position is lower than that of a white family where the head dropped out of high school. So this feeds into the narrative of, can we simply work hard, study hard, and address inequality? There's an amazing ladder in America for anyone hard. to climb, right, anyone sure. to climb it. The answer is no. When we start getting into these narratives of a post-racial society, we're not there. Now we can come up with comprehensive programs that include everybody, but we need to do it differently this way so that we make sure nobody is left behind, regardless of your race, gender, disability status, etc. <laughs> They're virtually right. So that that was meant to summarize my basically my framing and where my scholarship is. Where I, you know we talk a lot about human rights in the context of civil rights, in the context of political rights, and from my perspective, if we don't deal with economic rights, then those other rights aren't really facilitated to the best that they can be. We know that as long as people are hungry, if they're homeless, if they don't have adequate health insurance, they have limited ability to have choice and agency and dignity and those values that we want everybody to have as a basic human right. And if we look in general at society, I'd say that we, we are facing reinforcing inequalities, vulnerabilities, and obstacles to the goal of social mobility. We may desire that no matter what family you're born into, whether you're a male or female, whether you're black, white, Asian, Native American, Latinx, that you all, that everyone should have the ability to acquire the goals that they want to achieve in their lives. Um, and as I mentioned, my, my work is grounded in values and those values that I just mentioned. And what's good about being in a university, if you look at that third bullet, the academy gives me basically the agency and authenticity, the authenticity of being a professor whose work is supposed to be morally based in truth. Uh, it, it provides me that credential so that I can affect change. But I would encourage my other university colleagues 
to not just do research for the sake of knowledge creation, which is important in and of itself, but I would encourage my brethren to engage more with the public, to translate that scholarship into public impact. And, uh, you know, here's a model that we apply at Kerwin, the Kerwin Institute that, that was, uh, that Isabella named in the beginning, and that is we begin with research. Research is our foundation. We are truth seekers. My, my good friend Karen teach, taught, taught me a lot about truth when I served with her on the Board of Trustees at Brooklyn Friends School. Um, we, we seek truth. That is our foundation. And from there, we take what we learn from that knowledge. And, you know, truth research is an imperfect endeavor. Sometimes things you believed, we learned, and we learned that we weren't exactly right. Um, but as long as we're founded, our intellectual foundation is grounded in truth seeking, that's what we should be engaged in. And then it's not enough to, to uncover knowledge. I think we have an obligation to apply that in an actionable way, again, with the goal of improving people's lives, economic inclusion, civic engagement, and social equity. And then the third phase is we need to engage the public. We need to disseminate the information. We need convenings and conversation. We need for our work to be able to be informed by others, to tell us, are we right on track? Uh, are we not covering the right things? And did we actually get it wrong? And I'd say that we are in a, in a you know, there's plus and minuses to the societal context that we're in, but social media provides an, a direct mechanism for university faculty and others to engage directly with the public. And then here's some examples of public engagement. I had the uh, ability to give a TED talk about baby bonds, where with baby bonds, the idea around this is, we know that there's wealth inequality, as I described before, and we know that some, in some children are born into families with a great deal more resources than others. So the idea around baby bonds is, let's provide trust funds for every child, every newborn. Simply as a birthright, you're entitled to capital, a nest egg that the government will provide for you when you become a young adult so that you can begin your life with some, with some capital, some nest egg, some endowment to have the ability to purchase a home, to have the ability to have an education without debt, to have the ability to be entrepreneurial and start a business. This is saying, let, let's make sure that everybody has that opportunity in that, that base. Um, then, you know, I had to, I, I'd say that a lot of my work has been able to influence the Democratic part, platform. I've worked a lot with Senator Sanders, as well as other senators, uh, uh, quite a few. Um, I can say that I had another idea uh, with uh, William Darity, as well as others. This idea is not new or unique. Indeed, Franklin Delano Roosevelt talked about a federal job guarantee as a second bill of rights, where he knew as early as the 1940s that the evolution in American rights frame was one where we needed to think about economic rights. So I'm glad that we're in a moment where uh, we're starting to bring that up again to recognize that there is a base level of resources that people need to thrive in their lives. And perhaps a cornerstone of that should be the right to employment. That not just the right to a job, the right to a job with decent wages, decent benefits, that's used in a productive manner so that we can build up our public, human, and physical infrastructure. We could literally green our entire economy. We could ensure that there's care work for everyone. We could use our imagination to think about what are the goods and services that we collectively need that aren't being produced and put Americans to work, to put our society to work, to transform our, our society so that we're providing that infrastructure and eliminating involuntary unemployment, working poverty altogether, and removing the threat of unemployment for workers that are already working so that they can better bargain where they are. I mean, as a university professor with tenure, the threat of unemployment has virtually been removed so that I can pursue topics that may be controversial, research that may be controversial, and many other things. 
So other people should have agency in their lives uh, without the threat of unemployment, in my view. Um, I'd say that these ideas are gaining saliency. Uh, even the Wall Street Journal did a profile. Um, and then the rest is just some examples of public engagement. And I won't go through all the details. I'll just get to a final slide. Senator Cory Booker talking about baby bonds. Representative Joyce Beatty, we're talking about closing the women's wealth gap. This is, these are relationships from people that saw me give a talk that found me through Twitter. And it was heartwarming for them to come up and, and to be able to engage them. And then finally, this was a tweet that I received that literally brought me to tears. And I get choked up when I read it and talk about it. But it was someone who said, um, hi, Sandy Darity, hi, Derek Hamilton. My incarcerated students read your work this week, and all of a sudden they believe economic scholarship could matter to them and not just oppress them. This was so fulfilling to me because uh, it, it was indicative of being able to fulfill the goals that I wanted, that I wanted which is to be able to use my scholarship to empower others. And you hear me getting choked up as I talk about it. <laughs> All right. Um, I should keep the video up so you don't see me with any tears on. <laughs> no. All right. So how do I stop sharing? OK, I might need. Oh, here we go. Stop sharing. All right, I'm back. Um, so, you know, I, I can talk a little bit about this contemporary moment of COVID. Uh, we know that first and foremost, when we talk about the economy, um, we need to recognize that health is a part of the economy. And it's a false dichotomy when we say that, uh, let's send people to work and not as if sending people to work and putting them at, at risk if, if, if we aren't ready to go back to work because of COVID-19, thinking of that as a choice between having a good economy, I think is somewhat of a problematic framing because mortality has to be first and foremost, the key indicator of our economic well-being. And if we're thinking about the economy, first and foremost, we need to protect people's lives. And if we think about racial inequality, there are estimates that Black people are making up one third of the COVID fatalities or more when they make up only 14% of the population. And then we might ask, why is the black mortality rate so high? Well, we have an unjust racial wealth gap. We have a history of, of financial deprivation that has rendered some people in America, based on their group identity, more vulnerable to deal with an economic downfall, downtrend when uh, they won't have the flexibility to work at home, they have lower wages and benefits overall, and it renders them more economically insecure. Um, I think that with the context of COVID-19, a potential positive thing could be it spurs political action and social movement to implement a lot of the political and economic change that we've been talking about. In other words, if the vulnerability made vivid by COVID-19 can lead to political change towards an economic rights frame, then we can stave off inequality and promote a moral and just economy so that we can have shared prosperity, both in economic and physical well-being. And to achieve that, I argue that we need an anti-racist, anti-misogynist, inclusive economic bill of rights frame so that we can be better prepared for when there's a next pandemic or there's a next climate related catastrophe. And not only that, it would address our everyday vulnerabilities that many people live with whether or not we're in a pandemic. An economically just system is one where everyone has access to an adequate amount of resources of essential goods and services so that they can have agency in their lives. COVID-19 has made it clear that even the most affluent amongst us are vulnerable. I mean, we know the case of even 
a prime minister, Boris in, uh, in, in the UK, the prime minister in the UK was subject to the coronavirus. But when this subsides, hopefully we will ensure that no one live with this despair and vulnerability, again, regardless of whether we're in an economic crisis. I hope that it also teaches us to take steps where we can put in place an infrastructure to make the population identified by something as cursory as their race or gender not so vulnerable. Inequality is a political choice, and we can make a different choice. We have an inadequate social safety net system for the last 45 years as a result of what I believe policies around deregulation, gutting government social ser so services as well as social welfare, we ended up not just in the United States, but across the globe, environments of reinforcing inequality and obstacles to social mobility and, and political inclusion. In fact, we would have to reach back to the greatest generation, a generation born nearly 100 years ago, who entered their young adulthood right after the Great Depression to find a generation with lower home ownership rates than young adult millennials have today. And what's even more disheartening is that the racial gap in home ownership amongst millennials is as large as it's ever been for any generations since we've been tracking home ownership. In 2013, I delivered a TED talk that, and I began by stating, quote, that there is a narrative, an idea that with resilience, grit, and personal responsibility, people can pull themselves up and achieve success. This is what we call the American dream. This political discourse, it's upheld in a bipartisan way. Democrats, Republicans, across racial groups, blacks and whites alike, they all adhere to this discourse. Basically, it goes if black, brown, and poor people, if they would simply reverse their self-sabotaging attitudes, behaviors, and adopt the right attitudes, norms, and behaviors, that that would be the pathway towards equality. But what's missing in that narrative is all the cases of these individuals, black, poor, or whatever, who also exemplify perseverance, grit, and hard work but aren't able to attain successful economic outcomes. What has been glaringly missing from this narrative is the role of power, the role of capital, the role of endowment, and how having those resources in the first place can influence the structures and transactions by which people engage. Power and capital are self-reinforcing without any intervention, and they will do what they do best which is iterate and concentrate. We use words like choice, freedom, to describe what we believe is the benefits of unfettered government not intervening in our system. But all that is an illusion if people lack the basic needs of a job, of adequate income, of shelter, of food, and of health care. It is literally wealth that gives us choice that gives us freedom and gives us optionality. If you are an essential worker with a pre-existing condition, if you have wealth, you can make a decision where you say, I'm not gonna put myself at risk. If you are displaced from your job and you have wealth, you, are, you have the ability to withstand or with that, that economic calamity. Public power should, public policy should empower all people to live dignified lives and shield vulnerable populations from predatory actors with self-interested goals aimed at extracting and exploiting them. There are a set of enabling goods and services that are so critical for our life, our liberty, and our self-determination that that quantity, their quality, and access to these should not be based solely on one's ability to pay. We need policies that ensure universal and quality health care, housing, schooling, financial services, capital, and the free mobility throughout society without the psychological and physical threat of detention or bodily harm because your identity is linked to race, gender, or some other cursory identity. 
And given our emerging inequality and political context, now is the time to do more. The time has come for us to be bold. The time has come for us to be transformative, to take the problems of inequality and stratification, take them head on. The good news is that change may be happening. I'm inspired by younger generations. They're leading this charge for change. There's Black Lives Matters. There's the Me Too movement and the recent youth-inspired global climate strike demanding the end of the use of fossil fuel. These are all examples of how younger generations and social movements, they're redefining economic good to incorporate the principles of our common humanity, of sustainability, and our shared prosperity. I'm gonna end by returning to the e narrative and ethos of the American dream. And I'm gonna cite one of my favorite basketball players, LeBron James. In January, in a Nike commercial, he succinctly and eloquently sums up a perfect aspiration of what the foundation of an American dream should and can be from my perspective. He said, quote, we always hear about an athlete's humble beginnings, how they emerge from poverty and, or tragedy and beat the odds. And then the video goes in and shows a lot of rags to riches stories of people overcoming poverty uh, with you know, a, a great talent that allowed them fame and fortune. And those are good stories and I don't mean to denigrate them in any way. But LeBron Jane goes on and says, quote, they're supposed to be stories of determination that capture the dream. They're supposed to be stories that let you know that people are special. Then there's a pause and he says, but you know what would be really special? If there were no more humble beginnings. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Um, there are a few questions from the registration. Um, the first one is, what do you hope the normal the new normal looks like after the pandemic. Uh, the second one is, what role can students play in supporting economic justice? And then the final question is, why economics and what inspired you to pursue that field? So the new normal is um, an anti-racist, anti-misogynist economic bill of rights, where we decide what are the essential goods and services that all people need to thrive and that we use our immense public power to ensure that everybody has an adequate amount of those goods and services. We recognize that this notion of deficits, there's, in my view, there's no such thing as a deficit when public power is being used to invest in America's greatest resource, which is its people. And that is what an economic Bill of Rights frame would do. Uh, and we will be better prepared when there's a next pandemic, when there's a next climate related catastrophe, and we'll be better at dealing with our everyday inequality period. And as far as young people, um, the truth of the matter is, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm following your leadership. I'm watching the ways in which you build social movements, the ways in which you reject notions of we can't. When you say, when, when young people build these movements and say, we will not tolerate injustice. And like I mentioned, reference some of them, a lot of these movements like Black Lives Matter, like Me Too, like the Wall Street move, uh, it, Occupy Wall Street, they are very grounded in justice. They are very grounded in, we will not tolerate injustice. I will, I will say something about my generation. I came up in, and I'm gonna use a jargony term, I came up in an era of neoliberalism. And what neoliberalism, a brief definition might mean is that we believe that the market is the mechanism to distribute goods and services, whether we're talking about economic goods or any other type of goods, even social goods, that the market has some automatic sanctioning ability to incentivize good behavior and to sanction people that are engaged in being lazy, that are not as bright to encourage them to either work harder or find something else to do altogether. So my generation was seduced by that, that ability that 
also what comes about from that framing is that all you got to do is work hard. All you got to do is study hard and you will be fine. I encourage all young people to work hard and study hard, but I also recognize that that's not enough. That if you don't have structures, if you don't have resources to begin with, that does not ensure that you're going to have the ability to have command over your life. So my, my generation got seduced by that. Um, I, we thought that if we could only go to the Ivy League schools, we would be fine. And I think if we look today, um, I'm going to call that a failed experiment, especially when we look at the fact that even when you go to college, a lot of times you graduate with a lot of debt. We have record levels of student debt. I know that black graduates four years after graduation, the average level of debt for them is in excess of $54,000. So I think we can have a different society that says that we're not going to saddle you with the albatross of debt based on a narrative where we tell you that education is your only pathway to success. To me, that's pernicious. For me, I think that we should tell people we will ensure you have access to a quality education all the way through college, and we won't saddle you with debt. And we're going to ensure that you have all the stuff you need so that you can really be the captain of your fate. You can really be uh, in charge of, of, of your destiny. And then why an economist? Uh, uh, why, why am I an economist? Uh, I mean, if I'm truthful, uh, you know, I, I, had the, I had the privilege of growing up where I grew up in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, which is a different neighborhood today than it was when I was growing up but also attending Brooklyn Friends School, which is a, a school that is uh, rigorously academic, but also grounded in social justice. So I think uh, I was able to see people from various walks of life and that people were fundamentally not so different. Um, but also that experience taught me coming from Bed-Stuy and seeing poverty that I didn't want to be poor. I personally was rejecting poverty. So I thought that economics would be the pathway for me to be able to go to law school or business school. Um, but through college, I had discovery and said that I can have a fulfilling life pursuing a career that was more fulfilling to me personally than some of those other careers, which may be fulfilling to others, like an academic, and still be economically secure. I didn't know that till I got to college and then, um, also, it, it also was happenstance that I realized that the economic way of thinking, trying to uh, achieve some objective given some conditions, was very much how my mind worked. Uh, so I, I ended up, I guess, in a lucky position where I chose it for different reasons that um, ultimately led to why I love it. <laughs> Awesome, Derek, thank you so much. So at this point, we're going to open the floor for questions. If you have any questions or thoughts, please throw it up in the, the comments section. And right now we have a question from Yannick Gale, who's actually part of the Partners for Human Rights team at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights. Yannick, do you wanna ask your question? Sure, thank you, Jenny. And thank you, Dr. Hamilton, for this presentation. It's been very interesting. So my question is, what methods of direct or indirect engagement have you found most successful to not only affect policy, but to impact societal thought around social issues? I thought the examples that you shared around TED Talks, but not only being able to share some of your scholarship with incarcerated individuals was fascinating. And I wanted to know if you had other examples of being able to impact uh, the common man, someone who may not have even heard of uh, a TED Talk? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And uh, I guess what is fulfilling and proud is that the interaction can be at multiple levels, and, right? You can speak with a politician that's in the national stage, you can speak with a politician that's on the local stage, um, but beyond that, you can speak directly to students. Like this, for example, is empowering to me, and I hope fulfilling to you. I hope that, you know, if to the extent that you, that I have a compelling vision and message that um, not only does it uh, help inform you, 
that you've taken in ways that I can't even imagine, that, you, you, that this has an, a, an impact and an influence that will pay dividends towards societies that I can't even conceive of. So that is what gives me personal gratification from, from interaction. You know, I see, I, I know I have limitations also. I know I'm not, I'm not the best political strategist in the world. I think I'm somewhat good in it. I know that I don't, I'm, I'm not the best advocate, that there are people that do this full time and know very well how to advocate better than me. Um, but being able to engage in a cohesive and collective way where people are doing their part with a values-based focus. And some of the stuff I told you during this talk, you may say, well, you know, I don't think that's right, or and I might be wrong. But what could be common is where we begin, which is a shared value system for a society that we want. And that shouldn't be movable. That the principles and values around inclusion, engagement, and equity, and shared prosperity, right? If we can agree on that, then we can come together and influence each other and exchange with each other, critique each other in various ways so that we can come to a collective truth. Thank you, Dr. Hamilton. I, I know that we definitely believe in that shared value system and inclusivity at RFK Human Rights, so that was really inspiring. Um, our next question is going to come from one of our Speak Truth to Power lead educators in Connecticut, Chris Buckley. So Chris, I'm going to hand it to you. Thanks. Uh, hi, Dr. Hamilton. Um, so a number of my students are on here, and the next uh, thing that we're taking a look at is the civil rights movement, which uh, a lot of the ideas that you just shared about are, are reflective there. And as I was listening to you talk, a lot of what um, what Martin Luther King was fighting for in the poor persons campaign is very much reflected here. And so I was kind of curious about um, why perhaps you think maybe not as much progress has been made in those areas um, when it comes to economic progress um, and then you know perhaps also um, how young people might be able to take more of an active role in helping to level this kind of a playing field so i think perhaps that people saw the idea of treating others as equal as an easier thing to take on when you talk about civil rights and equality and so i don't know i just was kind of curious about your thinking on that you know these are all great questions and I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of my thought process broadly and then try to answer your question more specifically. You know, I, I was originally committed to an economic understanding of inequality, thinking that it was all based in resources. I grew to include a political understanding as well, understanding that even if you are able to acquire enterprise and resources, without some political codif codification, you are subject to extraction and exploitation. People can literally come and take it from you. And likewise, your ability to accumulate economic resources is largely predicated on a political system that allows you the ability to do so. Now, more recently, I understand a third pillar in that relationship. And from my perspective, when we get I'm going to use progressives as a, another, another label, and maybe we should be rejecting label. But when a progressive movement starts to understand the role of stratification, the role of race, the role of gender, not as an issue, but a pillar in this relationship, to me, that's when we become evolutionary and um, a strong movement that can no longer be curtailed. In other words, it is race itself that allowed us to change the discourse away from the United States trajectory coming out of the Great Depression with FDR and an economic rights frame, passed on to Martin Luther King, uh, as well as many other civil rights leaders, Coretta Scott King, et cetera, in a civil rights frame to make it more inclusive of, of all people, not just a, a certain type of people, and then likewise, it was race that allowed us to change our political economy frame. It was, it was making the argument that government was tilting the scale in an unfair manner in favor of these undeserving people. It was a reaction to the progress that had been made from both a New Deal as well as a civil rights movement that led to us scapegoating government 
as being in favor of undeserving Blacks, we started coming up with terms like super predators, welfare queens, deadbeat dads to describe a segment of the population. And not only did that reverse some of the gains from civil rights and the move and that trajectory towards leading to equity, but it also castigated poor white people as undeserving as well. In other words, they became other. They became not part of the, the mainstream. Somehow they were more like black people. And uh, the other aspect of the way race was used in this movement is that sadly, not only do people care about their absolute well being, sadly, we also care about our relative well being. And I imagine that many of us start thinking about how we fit in relative to others. So, one way in which as inequality continues to grow, you get vertical inequality, horizontal inequality becomes a trade off. You can tell a population, well, however unequal you may be, there is another group of people that are worse off than you. There's another group of people that are more wretched than you. And sadly, that has been a political mechanism that has been utilized at least since the mid 70s, along with a reversal of the, the, the justice programs we were talking about before, like the New Deal and civil rights program. So I think now if we trend towards back the pet the the if we trend back towards an economic rights frame, we have to ensure that it's done in an anti-racist and anti-misogynist way. I'm intentional on in using those terms because if we're ever going to get something that's solidified, solidified and not politically reversible, we have to recognize our common humanity, our shared prosperity our shared sustainability. We have to mitigate the ability to pit one population against the other so that one group can have horizontal equity more so than another group. And then what, I, I wanted to make one other point about it, uh, and that was, this is kind of a tangent, and it's related to affirmative action. Now, affirmative action was you know, a, a program that was getting beat up when I was younger, a young adult, um, it probably still gets beat up. But uh, the best article I ever read about affirmative action, the title of it was, was called, The Problem with Affirmative Action is That It Works. And I thought that was hilarious. And then when I read the article, I thought it was great. And what did the author mean by saying that the problem with affirmative action is that it works? Is that what is the purpose of affirmative action? Affirmative action is meant to desegregate elite aspects of our society. So affirmative action is meant to ensure that everybody has access to a Harvard education. Everybody has access to a Princeton education, for example. That it's not just one demographic in that, in, in that school, in that college, that university. And what the article said is that by exposing people who had previously not had access to that type of environment, it demystified elitism. And I hope everybody gets that lesson today. You know, I, 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 right now people are calling me Dr. Hamilton. And to be honest, I cringe a little bit when I hear it. I recognize that it is not meant to be cringeworthy. I recognize that people are saying it, offering me respect, adulation, and indeed I did earn that term. Um, but one of my goals in life also is to demystify what it means to be elite. That, that status, that, that criteria, there are things that you need to do to achieve it. And rightfully so. We probably don't want everybody in society just being an economist without going through some process. Um, but nonetheless, the things I went through to attain a PhD in economics is not something that is unattainable for others. So affirmative action served the purpose of demystifying elitism for those that did not have access in the first place. And one problem that occurs is a system that is built on hierarchy and inequality, it runs the risk of falling down when you're able to demystify some of that elitism of what it means to be successful.
Thank you, Derek. Um, this is Karen again. So I see a comment and then a question from Teresa. And it's great to see you, Teresa, former high school friend. Um, awesome to see you here. So take it away, Teresa. A little, it might be noisy in my house dog, so I'll say, I'll try to go quickly. Um, I have a fairly high number of high school students who in the closure kind of disappeared. I tried reaching out, reaching out, reaching out. I know a lot of them uh, were working in convenience stores and grocery stores. And when I heard back from a few of them, they had really upped their hours um, and were working a lot. The school district made the decision to only take either the marking period three or four grade, whatever was, whichever was higher to be equitable to all students. Um, plus it took some time to get internet in some homes and uh, Chromebooks to these kids. So I think my question is, and a lot of the kids just stopped working and they accepted what they got from marking period three. So they never learned any of the concepts. Um, and these are sophomores, juniors, and seniors in high school. They were taking anatomy and physiology. Some of them wanted to go into, want to go into the healthcare field. So my question is, we will most certainly, probably, we think we're going to be online in September again um, for whoever knows how long. And I'm afraid the same thing's going to happen. And I'm not sure how to reach, if there's a way to reach out to these students and get them to take their academics as seriously as a paycheck. So thank you if anyone has input. No, I, I mean, that's horrible. Let, let's lead with that. that. That is horrible and it's preventable. So when I, I said the statement that inequality is a choice, that's a choice and we can make a different choice. There's no reason we can't have an infrastructure around making something like high speed access to broadband and having the equipment to access it a universal right that everyone should have so that even when this pandemic ends and we're able to go back to, to school, uh, if in a physical way, there will be another pandemic. There will be another climate related catastrophe. So we are at a juxtaposition where we now need to make a different choice where we don't do that to people. We don't put them in that vulnerable position. And then later, blame them for their lack of success because of some attitudinal reason that they chose not to engage when in the first place the infrastructure wasn't there to begin with. So it looks like our um, hand raising option isn't working. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask Derek, please feel free to either say so in the, the chat box or go ahead and ask a question. And I know we have a lot of RFK staff on right now, so if any colleagues would like to ask any questions, please feel free to do so. I mean, it, I, I'll say something until the next question, which is uh, there's a concept called scarring, where uh, the, the notion of when there is an economic downturn, something bad happens to you, and scarring is related to your ability to recover from that. And uh, the, the last narrative that was described has the potential to scar some of those uh, young people who did not have access to schooling as a result of this pandemic, that it could set them back in an iterative way. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna say two things. We gotta be cognizant of scarring, um, but that also, um, Again, I keep saying that we have public power where we can do something about it. it is, we should also reject the notion that it's inevitable that they won't recover, that we, we can do things to make sure that people can recover from downturns. And then that said, I want to put younger generations in the context. You know, uh, uh, we are seeing, in my view, a political change amongst younger people. And I hope it's sustainable. I hope, hope y'all continue to fight. Um, but also young people have gone through two cataclysmic two cataclysmic economic downturns fairly recently. There was the Great Recession and now there's COVID-19. So also in thinking about this concept of scarring, I think we as a society need to pay attention to young people. Uh, it, it, I cited that statistic about home ownership. Uh, the fact that 
a lot of the wealth that was destroyed from the Great Recession limited the ability to afford people a down payment on a home to be able to have a mechanism by which people have generally been able to grow their wealth. And then we also know about student debt. So as people go to college more, having this, this, uh, this uh, debt to start out your life, I think when we think about policy, we really should consider young people and a lot of the external economic forces that are, are, are placed upon them and how, they're gonna, how their adulthood is going to transpire. Excellent. Thank you, Derek. And it looks like we have another question from Rochelle in New Jersey. How are you? Um, I'm a high school Spanish teacher. I teach levels two, three, and four. And I always highlight social justice issues that are faced in the Latino communities or Spanish countries, um, access to clean water, access to education, um, child labor laws, um, education law, things of, of, you know, depending on the level of language, it depend, it'll dictate how deep I go into a certain topic. Um, I am finding, however, a challenge in finding uh, resources that can help me um, provide this information to my students. Um, I haven't found any curriculum that really focuses on social justice issues. It touches upon it, but not in depth. Um, so I was wondering if uh, you knew of any um, activists, speakers, uh, books, podcasts, anything that can help me um, supplement my current curriculum um, and I can, I can further my research. Yeah, no, that, that's a good question. Uh, I'm happy to share my syllabus, but, you know, I guess it, it's more targeted towards MA students, but there's some reading. I'm sure, our, I, I'm sure uh, there's a reading list with RFK, probably. That's, that's my guess. Um, but then I'm, I'm also thinking there are some advocacy organizations that are putting together syllabi. So when and again, this is young people, and I don't have a specific reference to you, but whenever there's a, you know, when there was the, 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 the shooting that took place in Florida, and I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of the location, um, but a syllabus emerged about uh, how to address the issue of, of, uh, of, of addressing gun control. When there is a, a a case like Trayvon Martin occurs, oftentimes there'll be a syllabus that, that, that emerges and through the internet, people can find the syllabus that puts together writings around something that took place. And then I'll also point out that there are groups like Black Youth Project, BYP 100, uh, and they're based at University of Chicago. They also are engaged in putting together reading lists and information that, that uh, can empower people with knowledge so that they can uh, can can uh, have have better information to address justice. That was a rambling answer. I apologize for that. And I'll just jump in. So, Rochelle, yeah, as Derek mentioned, we do have some Spanish language materials, and on our call, we have our colleague from Madrid, from RFK Spain. So I just sent you a message. If you just ping us, we'll make sure to connect you with what we offer and then also with Anthony, who is with RFK Spain. So we can certainly help populate your Spanish language and materials around human rights and social justice. So Derek, I, I have a question. This is Karen again. So, so much of what you talk, you're you talking about and, and the ideas and policies that you're you advancing um, really will scare a lot of people, right? They'll say, well, how do you afford that? How can we do this? Um, we don't have the money to give everybody born $3,000. Um, how do you respond to that? And as educators, if we're thinking about how to bring this thinking into the full range of content that we deliver 
uh, to our students or for us in trainings with students and teachers like I know how I would respond to it, but you're kind of in in that a lot, um, particularly working with Senator Sanders. So how do you respond to that, that concern and, and, and understandably that people would have? Yeah, I have a good colleague who has a book coming out entitled The Deficit Myth, and it's Stephanie Kelton who wrote the book. Uh, but, you know, I, I think uh, I, I respond two ways. I mean, first is we are making political choices now that cost a lot of money. So we just passed a, a tax cut that over the next 10 years will lead to two plus trillion dollars going to the wealthiest amongst us. So that was a choice. Um, we do other things when there's a need to go to war where we are able to amass large amounts of resources with relative ease. If we look at COVID-19, admittedly, the response is not adequate, but there was a whole lot of unprecedented things done by our federal government, which included literally sending checks to the American people and the ability to amass that money was literally the stroke of a pin. Here is what I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna use this term, the other side has been able to uh, put upon the narrative of the way government finance work. They describe the government as a household. And like a household, you know you have to spend, you can't spend more than what you have without acquiring crushing debt that will lead to an iterate downward spiral. That is not the situation in which our federal government is in. Our federal government is a sovereign monetary entity and that word is key, a sovereign monetary entity. As long as resources are being invested towards productive capacities, and then infl the only check on the US government's ability to spend is really inflation. The, the, and inflation does not become a problem as long as we're investing in productive capacities. Throughout history for the last at least 40 years, it has never been the case that interest rates on government bonds has exceeded our growth rates, or I guess it can not say, in general, it doesn't exceed our growth rates. So it is a myth that our deficit is going to bankrupt our country or limit our ability to um, spend on productive resources. In fact, when the government spends down our deficit, what happens is the American people take on more debt. So it, it is almost a transfer of, by government engaging in spending, it is reducing the debt that American people have. So uh, I, I think the, the big problem was convincing us and con constraining us in the false notion of scarcity that there are limited resources that our government has when throughout history and even contempor in a contemporary way, the real check or constraint on government spending is inflation. And we have not had serious concerns with inflation for a very long time. So Wade, do you want to to ask that, uh, one of my colleagues, Wave McMillan, has a follow-up to that question. <laughs> Wade? Wade, are you there? <laughs> I was muted, and I was very <laughs> eloquent in setting up my question. <laughs> Um, so I'll try to do my best to repeat myself. But Derek, I was wondering, we do work all around the world and um, we've got partners all around the world. And um, I am wondering if you could speak just a little bit in the time we have remaining on the unique challenge in the American, the US American context of talking about economic inequality when we have two main political parties and their different economic approaches historically since the 1970s have not been too different from each other. Um, whereas the ideological and policy spectrum uh, variants in political parties in other countries, most other countries around the world 
provides much richer options and ways of thinking about economic inequality than we have here in the United States. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to the unique United States context and challenge given the way our, our um, two main political parties approach economic policy. Yeah, and, and I would say that unfortunately, uh, our consensus around market solutions and marketized solutions or neoliberal economics is spreading throughout the world and has mm -hmm. been spreading throughout the world. So the world, sadly, there, there are a lot of places that are becoming more like us. <laughs> um, but to answer the question, in the mid 70s, we ended up with a consensus across party lines towards what, what, uh, what I've been calling neoliberalism. And neoliberalism isn't just an economic way of thinking, it is a political economy way of thinking. Because you know when people say, well, neoliberalism just means we're gonna allow the market to make decisions. Well, that's not completely true because government does intervene in ways that protects capital in non-market-based non ways. Government does intervene to ensure that, for example, the finance sector will always be uh, solvent, and not only solvent, but uh, uh, <laughs> a, a leader. Sometimes the interest of people will be sacrificed for the interest of finance, and I can give specific examples of that. Um, so the question is, why did that emergence take place? And I'm not sure if I have a completely adequate answer to why, um, but I do believe that race had a lot to do with that. I do believe, but now it's more nuanced and more strategic than just race only, because there were there were powerful forces, and by and what I mean by powerful forces, basically I'm talking about those with a great deal of resources, those that had a lot of economic power that worked towards changing rules and structures so that the trend we were on towards more equity would not continue. Now, of course, there were other aspects. Again, I don't want to oversimplify. There were examples of um, stagflation coming out of the 1970s with oil crisis, et cetera. So through economic crises, you have opportunity for uh, huge political shifts and economic shifts. Likewise, today with COVID-19, I'm hoping that this presents an opportunity so that we can have a different economic political economy. So you had the confluence of these things taking place in the 1970s. So you had, uh, you had growing unemployment combined with inflation. You had a scenario where uh, there was intentional trying to rewrite structures of our economy to uh, change course and favor capital and finance. You had a Federal Reserve System that used monetary policy in a way to protect finance by ensuring that by in thinking about a trade-off of low interest rates or high interest rates, they made sure that interest rates were high enough that finance was was again kept not only kept solvent but but maintained at high levels. You had all this confluence, and then I'm gonna I, I've been waiting to say the one that I think was perhaps the biggest influence. And that was race. I think, again, race was the critical and strategic ingredient by which you are able to persuade the masses of the population to, you know, when people say, you know, there's the, the narrative of, uh, I can't remember it exactly. I guess I'm getting older. My mind is, is not as good as it used to be. Um, but people argue that, well, are white people stupid to vote against their economic interests? Um, and, and I know that's a crude way to put things. To me, the answer is no. To me, uh, the, it, we, we might make some political decisions, we might characterize them as somewhat immoral, um, but what was used in my view, race was used as a mechanism to offer some groups of people relative standing compared to others to talk about this group of people is threatening your way of life to talk about some values-based proposition and also to restore a hierarchy that we've had historically around uh, a race. And, and that was used politically 
to put forth narratives that were not um, factual in my view, and also might have went against a populist movement where we all would have been better off with a different set of policies in order to lead to uh, these narratives in this economic system where markets have become centralized and inequality and the responsibility of vulnerability went from that of the state and that of corporations and put onto individual households and families who have limited capacities in terms of resources to be able to absorb shocks in a way that corporate entities and governments can. So, so I see that we are over time. I don't know if anybody has any last questions, but um, before I pass to Jenny and Laura, I just want to personally thank you, Derek. Uh, our, our, our journey goes back quite a few years, and it's just um, a real privilege and honor to learn from you and to spend time with you. And Isabella had to go finish some schoolwork, so she said the same. She says Blue Pride. Um, uh, so I want to thank you and then pass off to Jenny and Laura. Derek, thank you so much. This was amazing. Your knowledge is incredible. I, I've learned so much from you. I'm sure everyone else on this, this call has today as well. Um, I just want to remind everyone, as Karen mentioned, we do have another session on Monday at 9.30 with Marina Pisklikova, who will be talking about domestic violence. She's extraordinary, so um, be sure to register for that. And if you have a moment, please answer the three questions we sent. They are, if you scroll up to the top of the chat, you'll find them there. What issues do you most care about? What change would you like to see on that issue or issues? And how have you or would you like to take action? And you can send your responses to sttp at rfkhumanrights.org. Any I questions? guess I'll, I'll say thanks also. And, and this was not only pleasurable, it was challenging. And um, I'm glad that it was challenging because again, that's based in truth and integrity where you are kicking the tires so that uh, we can be grounded in our intellectual foundation. So thank you. Thank you. I think that's it. Great. Unless we have any other questions, any other questions before we sign off? I believe we're okay. Great. So if you, um, if you happen to walk away and, and have some questions or something come up, please reach out to all of us at Speak to Power and we'll connect you with Derek or we'll answer it or um, whatever we need to do to keep the ball moving forward because we need change desperately. We need equality and justice in this country desperately and not just based on how much money you have or the color of your skin or your agenda. Uh, um, and we need to push that change now right now so Derek thank you so much thank you thank you so much Derek <laughs> thank you this, this really was tough y'all are a tough group <laughs> I, I'm gonna go talk to my economist for a day easier <laughs> uh, Derek 